Welcome to Digital Hospitality. I'm your host, Sean Walchef. This is a Cali BBQ Media production. We believe that every business needs to be digital first, especially brick and mortar businesses like restaurants. We also believe that every business is in the hospitality business, whether they know it or not. Um, our goal on this show back when we started in 2017 was just to have really cool conversations that can help you the listener, you, the viewer, move your business forward to realize that you're not alone. Um, there are other crazy people just like you. Um, there's also smart people out there. Um, and our goal is to find those smart people, to ask questions, to learn lessons from failures, lessons from successes, and uh, hopefully uh, build a community. We've got an incredible community of people. If you want to join us on LinkedIn every Wednesday, every Friday, uh, you can join the Rising Tide community, follow Cali BBQ Media, and we will get you an invite to that. But today we have Michael Fishman. He is the new VP of Sales for Commerce 7. He is also a managing partner at Kumiko and Jung. And those are probably, I think, some of the hottest spots in Chicago. I haven't been, but this is what the internet tells me, and this is what friends um, in the industry have told me. So, uh, Michael, welcome to the show. That, thank you. That was a great introduction. And might I add, the internet is always right. So definitely trust <laughs> great on the internet. Well, this is the Internet Storytelling Podcast, and uh, we, we're, we're grateful to have you on the show. Mike, can you let's start with uh, your new role, VP of Sales of Commerce? What is Commerce Seven? What do you guys do? Yeah, sure. Um, Commerce Seven is a platform that's actually used by wineries, so a little bit outside of the the immediate restaurant space, but it helps them with their e-commerce and wine clubs, POS system, uh, reservation system, inventory, CRM, just a total suite of of software that wineries cool. can use to help manage the business. Uh, it is a point of sale. Uh, it is partially a point of sale and partially everything else that I just mentioned. Yeah, we do a lot. We do a lot of different stuff for wineries. Awesome. Well, uh, let's get a little bit into your background. You've got a, a, a tasty background, worked at Toast, worked at Grubhub, worked at Open Table. Um, yeah. Can you share any any stories from what you've learned in the digital hospitality restaurant tech space? Yeah, I, I think I can. Um, you know, I'll start out by saying that the best experience that you can have working for a technology company in the restaurant space is working for a restaurant company in the technology space. You, you want to align yourself with people who have empathy and compassion for that industry first um, and build a technology product around that second. Um, so, so that's the first thing I'll say. The second thing that I'll say is everything, uh, virtually everything that I know about restaurants uh, or knew about restaurants prior to becoming a managing partner at, at some great places, uh, I learned from these technology companies. I, I learned um, from, on the operations side, on the technology side, and, and you know the ability to sort of interpret what's going on without being on the restaurant floor. I like to say that I work on the restaurants, not in the restaurants, because um, you know as we've alluded to, I, I work in the tech space too. Um, so, so from my perspective, you know, being able to say that you work for a restaurant company that helps restaurants with technology is the place where you want to start. That's awesome. Can you bring me into your <clears throat> first role as managing partner? Which, which brand was it? How did it happen? Yeah, yeah totally. Um, so my first role as a managing partner was with a restaurant called Oriel that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, Oriel uh, was a really cool experience because almost nobody involved had any experience in building a restaurant. I mean, a little bit here and a little bit there, um, but we, we sort of learned along the way. Uh, my partners at Oriel, our, our chef partner at Oriel's name is Noah Sandoval. And he was previously a chef at a restaurant called Senza here in Chicago. Senza being the only restaurant in the world to have a Michelin star and be 100% gluten-free, which is kind of how I got into restaurants because my wife is not by choice uh, gluten free, right? She's she's celiac. So um, trying to find restaurants for birthdays or anniversaries led me to doing a ton of research and getting really excited about uh, you know what these places had to offer. So we ate it at Senza probably two dozen times over over the course of when it was open. And as that was slowing down, I said to him, you know, if you're ever looking to do something on your own, I would love to be involved somehow. I don't know everything, but I know some stuff. 
Um, and one day we were bowling and it just kind of turned a corner and we're like, all right, I, I guess we're doing this. He had a great team in mind that he wanted to put together. He wanted to be his own boss. Uh, and, and luckily he took a shot on me. So we took about a year to build the restaurant. Uh, definitely learned some stuff. Um, had some great partners along the way in terms of landlords and investors and, and uh, other people. Uh, and for the first month and a half, uh, not a lot of people showed up. There were, there were Thursdays with zero people on the books. And for a restaurant with ambitions to be one of the best in the world and eventually getting two Michelin stars, that, that's tough because you have a, a good amount of overhead, right? Uh, but we believed in the product and about a month and a half in, we got a great review from Mike Sula at the Chicago Reader. Uh, and from then on, the books were packed 90% plus. Mm. Um, so, so fortunately... Uh, that worked out well. That was my first foray into restaurants. Um, we paid our investors back in basically record time. And some of them got the bug and wanted to do some other projects. And, and those other projects led us to Kumiko and Jung uh, a couple of years later, which I'm sure we'll get into. Let's go. Was Kumiko before Jung or they at the same time? Yeah, we did it. We did them at the same time. So they of opened course. with <laughs> we, they opened within three months of each other, which was really, really fun. I'll tell you the advantage of opening multiple restaurants at the same time is it's really hard to forget the processes with permits and licenses when you yeah. just did it. Um, so at least there was a little bit of a rhythm to it. We were able to use the same contractors. We had virtually the same group of investors. So it, it kind of streamlined it a little bit. Now, both absolutely came with their challenges, um, but but... I actually consider uh, myself kind of fortunate that we got to do two at once. That's amazing. Uh, so recently, I, I have to talk about this because we believe in smartphone storytelling and no one's coming to tell your story. You posted something on LinkedIn about a month ago. Yeah. You got almost 2,000 likes, 124 comments, 42 reposts. I mean, I would love to see the analytics of the actual reach that post got almost, um, almost 500,000 views 500,000 close to 400,000 unique impressions. I don't know where that came from. I don't know how LinkedIn's algorithm works, how people found it, but they found it. And it was, it was crazy, but keep, keep going. I love your, uh, I mean, I think I, I think that they found it because it was the truth. And I think, I think that's so what the algorithm is supposed to do. It's supposed to push content that, will be valuable to a audience. And uh, can you share what, what was that? What was that post about? Yeah, absolutely. So for, for the first time in my career, I had found myself uh, the victim of a layoff. Happens a lot in tech. And, and I was fortunate to make it about 15 years without having to endure it. And after I had found a job uh, uh, following the layoff, I didn't want to just do the obligatory LinkedIn post like, hey, I got a job. Everybody congratulate me. That that seemed um, it seemed like it didn't serve the community. And, and like you were saying before, like, like we were talking about. Hospitality is in everything that you do, right? You, you, you want to create a better situation for everybody else. And if someone's going to look at my LinkedIn page, I want them to find value out of it. So I posted a couple tips on my experience and how you might uh, uh, find a job in a more efficient way. Just some tips and tricks to help you both on the actual job search. And I think a little bit from the mental health perspective. One of the tips that I gave was just go for a walk. Like you had a bad interview, you're frustrated, get outside and go for a walk. Listen to some music, whether it's relaxing music or really angry music. I, I did both a little Ed Sheeran, a little Slipknot, never hurt anyone. Um, and uh it reached a lot of people and I'm glad that it did. I've had strangers and fellow coworkers alike reach back out on a personal level, uh, thanking me and telling me how they're utilizing the the tips that I gave. And, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's the least that I could do to help give back to, uh, to that community. The results are in National Restaurant Association show, Kyle and Sarah and myself. We were at the Davo sales tax booth and we were polling restaurant owners on the floor. This was a very unscientific poll, but the results are resounding. Restaurant owners do not like sales tax. 
Nobody likes sales tax. Doesn't matter what business owner you are, small business, big business, Davo automates the sales tax process. We are so grateful that Davo is the sponsor of this show. They automate sales tax at our Cali barbecue restaurants. It is $50 a month that integrates with all the major point of sale partners, including Toast. So if you want to sleep at night, if you want to not worry about sales tax, go to Davo, check them out. Davo Sales Tax. Uh, let us know how they're helping automate your sales tax in your restaurant so that we can share your Davo story on digital hospitality. Hey everyone, uh, Avi Gorin, CEO and co-founder of Marquee. And I want to talk about the customer journey for a second. You never know as a restaurant owner where your guests are truly coming from. End of the day, we do see some patterns around two types of search behaviors, direct versus discovery. Direct search, for an example, would be jumping into Google and saying Cali barbecue hours, right? I know where I want to go to eat, but I'm missing a key detail. I need a little bit more information. Discovery, which is the bulk of searches, is barbecue in San Diego, restaurants near me, takeout near me, right? One of the best ways to be found for more discovery searches is leveraging keywords. Reviews are basically free content for you to leverage. Think about keywords that are relevant to your brand, your location, and include as many of those in your review responses as possible, right? How can you go about doing this? Let's set up reports, utilize tools like Google Trends, find out what's going on in your area and how you can help leverage these keywords and review responses because someone else is doing that, right? If you need some examples, you could do anything from including summer menu, gluten-free menu, um, leverage specific menu items like the dreaded and beloved spice pumpkin anything in your review responses, right? Let them know what's coming. Let your reviewers know something they should come back and try. And of course, if all of this just seems overwhelming and daunting because you're already running a, a restaurant and have enough on your plate, just leverage the team at Marquee to do this for you. We handle all of this. We're experts in this space. We can automate this. So it's just another item that you know you are taking care of. Again, that's marquee.com, M-A-R-Q-I-I, M-A-R-Q-I-I.com. Know you. However, we did recently buy M-A-R-Q-U-I-I.com. So if you do misspell it, we got you. You'll still find us. We can still help you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the the value props that you put in, you talk about acting fast, yeah. um, not feeling sorry for yourself, leveraging your network, um, which is something that it's incredible to me that in 2024, you know, we're recording this podcast, but the tools that we have at our fingertips that have literally already been created by these technology professional, these brilliant minds to create the Facebooks and the LinkedIn's and the YouTube's yeah. and like Spotify. And you and I are having a conversation on zoom. That's going to get repurposed and it's going to put on Apple podcasts and it's going to go on YouTube. It's like yeah. all of these things are at our fingertips and are at our disposal. Yet sometimes we don't have the courage to hit publish, you know, cause it is a scary thing to admit that you have been laid off. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. It's I a human. It's a human thing. Yeah, I wasn't proud of it at all. Right. Yeah. Um. You know, uh, on top of the post that I made after I found a job, I also made a post when I had lost my job, and yeah. and you have to show a little bit of humility and say like, look, this is the first time this has happened to me. I believe in my value. I believe in my worth, and I want everybody to know that I'm searching for the next opportunity where I can contribute. Um. And that's not a fun thing to talk about, but. Like you said, we have the tool, in this case, LinkedIn, for, for me to leverage and get the, the support of that entire community. And, and, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work at some great places, uh, meet some great people, whether it be at Open Table, Toast, Grubhub, whatever it is. Um, and they all reached out to me in my time saying, hey, I, I have a friend who's here. You might want to check out this job. And that was really helpful too in, in building a pipeline of companies that I might be interested in working with, uh, you know, ultimately... Uh, I came to Commerce 7, which I think is, is, has been a really great decision so far. I love the team over here. Um, but yeah, man, that, that vulnerability is tough, but utilizing the tools you have and being able to push through it is even more important. So partners 
are so important. I mean, we're in the hospitality business. We can't do this thing by ourselves. Uh, we're so fortunate that Dan Diaz and F3 Tech, they introduced me to you to have you on this show. Um, yeah. So many people that listen to this show, I've I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to have these types of conversations, but can you share specifically what is Dan Diaz and F3 Tech? What have they done for your restaurant brands? Well, well, first of all, let me say Dan Diaz, for those that don't know him out here, uh, out there is, can I, can I curse on here? You can cuss. Yeah. He's the fucking man. Let me, let me tell you a story about how Dan and I first connected. We were both working at Toast. Uh, he was one of our implementation specialists. I was one of our account executives and I had uh, sold like an old school Italian uh, deli here in Chicago. Great sandwiches. I'll plug them. Fontano's. They're great. Perfect. Um, and uh, because it was such an old school environment, the team there was not used to implementing new technology. Yeah. Cloud-based technology, uh, their wires were all over the place and the menu needed to be tweaked in so many ways because every sandwich and every salad has different modifiers and everything like that. And Dan was the implementation specialist that was riding along with me for that one. And I showed up to the install to make sure everything was going right. Cause for a lot of, if there's any salespeople out there who are listening, uh, taking care of your customers after you get your commission check is yeah. absolutely an investment that you need to make. But I digress. Uh, Dan and I both realized that we were of the mindset, again, that we should be treating our restaurant partners like they treat their customers. And if we do any less than that, if we walk away from that site and the system isn't installed perfectly and they don't know how to use it, it's going to reflect bad on toast it's going to reflect bad on the restaurant when their customers have to deal with these issues. And that, that's just a problem that nobody wants to have. So me and Dan left that job site, basically like, I, I, I get it. I see you. I like you. This is how we operate. This is how you yep. should operate. Um, so Dan started F3 uh, a year or so later, maybe two years later. I don't remember the exact date. We had toast in the restaurants. Uh, I sold toast to myself. Also, if you're going to a <laughs> restaurant, you might want to work for a POS company. Um, and uh, I was just having some minor issues uh, with the technology, uh, things going in and out. Maybe the wiring wasn't as good, something like that. And I called Dan. And I'm just like, hey, would you be able to help me out? Like, generally speaking, I know how to do this stuff. When I call support, I should just automatically get transferred to tier two. I've worked for the companies. I know what's going on. And he came out and he helped me. And I said, all right, you have to let me pay you. He said, no, I shouldn't have said that. He's not going to be like that. He said, all right, <laughs> can I buy you a bottle of tequila? He was like, no. I'm like, all right, then, that, then you're coming to this restaurant with your wife and you're having dinner. Yeah. I'm still not sure he's taken me up on that. But that is to say that he's helpful and a great guy and appreciative of, of relationships and everything like that. Fast forward, now I do pay him, okay? Everybody out there, you should use F3 because they're <laughs> incredible and you should pay them. Um, and they've been an absolutely awesome resource on two different levels. Number one, you know, I've, I haven't worked for Toast since uh, 2000 and, oh God, I think it was like late 16 or 17, something oh, wow. like that. And so the product has evolved and exactly. I don't necessarily keep up with all of it the way that I should. I still have the foundational... Uh, uh, you know, methodology down, but um, I don't keep up with it the way I should. So Dan and his team have acted as a support system for if we need any help with toast, right? With, with our POS system or anything like that. But secondly, they manage the toast network, the stuff that I don't know about the actual internet that toast flows through. Um, I don't know about that. And if I called Toast support. Sometimes it's hard to determine whether or not it's AT and T or if it's Toast Network, and you're running up and down the stairs, and you're in the middle of service. Like I said, I work on the restaurants, not in the restaurants, which means I'm at home watching only murders in the building, and something goes down, and I'm running over there to try to figure it out and troubleshoot with Toast. Uh, not anymore. They call F3. They're managing our network, and they are super efficient in responding. They're super professional and knowledgeable in knowing what's going on. And it's it's just been a great resource for our team to use. How do you balance being a dad with your job? Um, oh, that's an interesting question. My, you know, we talked about Commerce 7 before and working uh, in wineries. 
my son has been telling everybody that I'm the vice president of wine, which <laughs> how old is he? Uh, he's six and a half. That's uh, fantastic. Which is interesting. But I have I have a uh, a ten year old daughter and a six and a half year old son. Uh, and honestly, man, like that stuff comes first. Yep. My son has a skateboard lesson on Tuesday evenings, and I make sure I'm done working uh, in time to get him there. Uh, my daughter dances for like. 17 hours a week. And if she has a dance recital or a dance show, like I'm there, I will, if I'm out of town, I will fly home as early as I can for that kind of stuff. Um, I think that that's gotta be the center of your world because it's grounding, right? Like that's mm. sort of why we do it. Nobody grew up saying, man, I, I really want to be in sales, right? You wanted to be an astronaut. You wanted to be a pro athlete. You wanted to be, you know, whatever you wanted to be a chef, maybe, right? You wanted to do the cool thing. Uh, I don't know that sales has ever been the cool thing, but I really, really uh, enjoy it. But make sure to keep my family at the center of the world, because uh, otherwise, what am I doing it for? I love that. What What have you learned about sales? Uh, a lot. Everything. Let's make that question a little bit smaller. What are you curious That's, about? I need a story. Give me a story where you thought you knew something and either a mentor or an experience taught you what you thought you knew was completely wrong. And then you started doing something and things started to change. Um, I'm going to merge the two worlds together uh, between the restaurant world and my, my sales career. Um, over COVID, um, I was talking to one of our investors um, who, who worked basically in finance uh, in his career. He's retired now. And he mentioned that when they were evaluating a company, almost like they would make it as small as possible. Like you can't really compare one company to every company in the world. Your data set's too big and none of it really means ever, anything, right? You got to compare apples to apples. And it made me realize that I didn't know how to compare apples to apples. Um, you know, work, working in sales management, that kind of stuff is really important because what you're trying to understand are the triggers or the levers that are going to make somebody better at their job. What can I actually implement as a manager or teach as a manager or a sales coach that's going to make somebody have a better performance? And yeah. sometimes when you just pull averages from the whole company, it doesn't really do anything. So in Thinking about that and putting it in the context of, you know, my, my nine to five, I decided over COVID I needed to get better at something. And I got really good at Excel or Google Sheets or, or whatever, you're, whatever program you're using. Um, and my ability to interpret data and splice data and make it really specific so I can pull out uh, insights that will help people. Uh, came to fruition. Uh, thanks to my my brother too. He's the one who taught me how to do all of it. He, he works in accounting too. Um, but uh, I, I, I would say like, that's it. In sales, you can't always trust your sacred cows. If there's any salespeople out there listening, your manager is yelling at you right now for listening to a podcast and not getting more dials. Um, more dials does not always equal more success. You know that. And somewhere deep down, your manager knows that. But being able to prove that on a spreadsheet with numbers is, is invaluable. So get really smart about data because uh, that's how the people who are at, whose job it is to interpret data actually do it. How do you close a whale? <laughs> um, well, you don't send them donuts. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> personal that's a personal antidote you can't just you can't just walk into a room uh and expect sprinkles to help you close the deal I, I think you close a whale by doing really good active listening at the beginning of the sales process uh understanding what problem they are trying to solve and understanding that their problem uh, i'm sorry that your solution is not a one size fits all solution for every every problem that they're going to have um so you sell the solution to their problem. Uh, everything else is just kind of bonus. You can work the bonus into the conversation, but if you're not actually solving the problem that they want to solve, and if, if you haven't identified why there's urgency behind that problem that they're trying to solve, then you're probably not going to get to the finish line. The other thing that I would recommend for a whale of a deal 
is get everybody involved as early as possible and treat each individual uh, 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 with equal reverence in the sales process and the conversation. Don't send one follow-up email to everybody. Send a follow-up email to each person addressing their concerns and why your solution can solve that concern. Be as, be as detailed and hospitable about it as you would in a restaurant. If we have four people at the table, one of them is gluten-free and one of them is pescatarian, uh, you better make sure that the food coming out of the kitchen does not have any red meat or uh, uh, white flour in it, right? Otherwise, you're going to be in big trouble. So treat it like you would if you were a server in a restaurant. Who's the biggest whale on your board right now? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about that. Really? Uh, Why not? Um, Just out of respect for the partner, because if they're a whale on the board, they haven't signed yet, and they okay. probably don't want their business out there. They might be using someone else. I don't want to trigger <laughs> anything here. Sean, I, who, I asked the hard question. You, that's, why, that's why we do this show. Who are, who are you working for? What's going on here? <laughs> We're working for the hospitality industry. I know. I know. If, I if feel you're that. selling a solution that's going to help a whale. I want to help I, you close the whale right I, here on this show. I appreciate that. Let's uh, let's <laughs> their business, their business for now. How many, uh, how many, how many, is there a time where you give up on a whale? Yeah, I think there is not permanently. But never, maybe for, never but maybe for the time being. Yeah, never, never permanently, but maybe for the time being. Right. Um, and that's more a function of just like understanding the value of your own time. Like how much time are you going to put into a deal that is not going to close? If yeah. there is a uh, uh, product efficiency, something that they need that you just can't provide at this point, and you have identified that it is an absolute must, um, then maybe now is just not the right time. Revisit it when it is, right? Set yourself a reminder to check back in in six months. Um, but as a function of your time, make sure that you're doing things that can make you money as well, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's why we're in sales, right? Um, make sure that you're performing activities that are going to get you to your goal and get your commission check higher. And if there's a whale out there that's just not ready to be uh, be harpooned, I guess would be the metaphor. Uh, maybe keep the harpoon in the holster. Why? By the way, I've never harpooned a whale. I just, I think that's the metaphor. <laughs> I think if, if it's not, don't uh, roast me in the comments. You're fine. Uh, what's you said that people don't aspire to be in sales yet. I think there's something very cool about sales that isn't talked about enough and isn't celebrated enough. How would you explain, you said your son talks about you as the wine salesman. <laughs> VP of what, wine. What would you, what would you share to your son about a lesson about sales? Um, if I'm talking to my son. Yes. Specifically. That's, that, I, I love seven year old. I mean, my boy's seven and nice. We talk to technology companies, we help them with storytelling. And most people complicate too many things. Even restaurateurs, we have a problem of, we have this big idea and you're like, what do you sell? Yeah. How about, how about tell me what you sell? Yeah. We're in sales and restaurants, you're in sales and technology. We're all selling something. I'm selling something to try to get my wife to let me watch the chargers, even though I'm a By chargers. The way, everybody <laughs> in technology uses the word platform. And I promise oh. you, none of your prospects know what a platform is. If no, I, I don't know what SMB is either. Don't use the word platform. I will die on that hill. Um, so if I were to give my son some advice on sales today, if he was thinking about it as a future career, uh, I mentioned that I got into restaurants in college, right? Uh, looking through, uh, my wife and I have been dating since, uh, we're dating since high school now, obviously we're married. Um, but like looking through restaurant menus and on websites to try to find places that would be exciting that she could still eat at. Uh, and that's what sparked my interest in restaurants uh, and me being able to get my first job at Open Table. I would say if you're really uh, thinking about getting into sales, maybe think about it industry first. Think about an industry that really excites you and try to find an opportunity to sell into that industry. I promise it'll make the day go by a lot faster and you'll be a lot more interested in learning about that industry and how to sell 
for me, it was a really smooth transition because I was on my computer prospecting and looking at restaurant menus all day. I mean, I worked at Open Table for seven, seven and a half years. I can't tell you the amount of menus that I would read. I would have to take lunch pretty early. I would end up getting hungry. Um, let's hope that doesn't happen with Commerce 7. I'll be drinking at 10 in the morning. But uh, f- find an industry that you're interested in. It'll make the experience a lot more enjoyable because sales is tough, right? You have to have a really thick skin and you have to hold yourself accountable and and be empathetic and and be able to you know look inward and say like, this is my fault. Why is it my fault? Whenever you lose a deal, you should go back and review that because it is your fault. Something happened. You either didn't prospect it correctly or you didn't run the demo correctly, didn't ask the right questions, whatever it is. Um, But it's tough and it makes it a lot easier if you're dealing with an industry that you can be passionate about uh, and or excited about. So I'm going to ask you your personal tech stack. Okay. I need to know, are you an iPhone or Android user? I'm an iPhone user, but it's it's an iPhone iPhone 12 mini. And if anybody anybody from Apple is listening, I will not upgrade my phone until you make a mini version of whatever iPhone you're on now. I don't want an iPad in my pocket. I don't. No iPad. No iPad in your pocket. I don't want an iPad in my pocket. I want the mini version of whatever you have now. Please, Tim Cook, if you're listening, please. Do you prefer phone calls or text messages? <sighs> Who's the phone call from? Uh, a friend. I prefer a phone call. You prefer a phone call over a text message? Uh, from a fr- If it's a friend I haven't talked to in a while, sure. <laughs> if it's somebody I talk to all the time, just text me. We- we've already caught up. Do you leave voicemails? No, big, big debate in the sales world about voicemails. Really? Let's hear Uh, it. Some people love to leave a voicemail. Uh, They have certain scripts or talk tracks that they use that they think get people to call them back. Uh, I think the more heads up that you're giving someone, the more they're going to want to shy away from a salesperson. Just call back like three times. And if they don't pick up by the third time, if they're never in their office or ghosting you, then you can use one of those scripts. Uh, but I, I find it as a, I find it should be a last resort. How many emails do you get a day? A lot. Um, between between the restaurants and the nine to five, it's got to be somewhere in like the fifty to seventy five range. 50 to seven. How many? Is that a lot? I, I'm, I'm sure people get a lot more. I get more for sure. Yeah. Maybe it's a not a lot, but I'm on Slack and I get a lot of Slacks. That's part of yeah. the tech stack. That's part of the, yeah, that's part of the tech stack. I'm big. Uh, I'm big into Slack. I don't know. Somebody invented Slack and said, Hey, remember the AOL chat rooms from like 1995? Let's do that. <laughs> but, but on Slack mass scale. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, that was brilliant. That was brilliant. Really smart. Um, do you prefer photos or videos? Videos. Videos. Yeah. Um, what music app do you listen to? Uh, I am on the Apple Music family plan with, Apple with music. the family. Yeah, so we're on, we're on Apple. The podcasts on Apple Podcasts yes. or Spotify? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I know everybody loves Spotify. I don't know why I haven't converted over if I'm supposed to. I'm perfectly happy with the uh, with the Apple experience, and maybe this will help them make a mini version of the new iPhone. Do you watch YouTube, and where do you watch YouTube? If I you watch, I watch a lot of YouTube uh, on screens at your house or uh, on your phone. Yeah, so I, I watch it on my phone. Uh, I watch it on my computer, uh, and I also have like the YouTube app on our TV. My my son is huge into skateboarding. We watch a ton of skateboarding on YouTube, on the TV. Uh, when I watch it from my phone, uh, that's usually like the personal stuff. So so my uh, YouTube algorithm consists of a lot of like old school WWE wrestling uh, oh and a lot of uh, like battle rap stuff. Okay. That's- that's for that's for another day, but a lot of battle rap and a lot of WWF stuff. And when I watch it on my computer, honestly, I'm watching it a lot for um, either work 
or or sometimes like podcasts to listen to. Sometimes uh, you know the video experience with a podcast uh, is a little bit more engaging for me. But I have a, a playlist on my YouTube of sales videos that I'll send to reps if they need you know certain information or somebody just explains something a better way than I do. Uh, so three different screens, but three different use cases. Smart. Uh, Apple Maps or Google Maps? Google Maps. Google Maps. What's your... but ways, ways in the car. Ways, ways in, in the car. car. Oh, because no. ways, well, what do you ways use Google Maps you? for? If you don't uh, use... So I use Google Maps for uh, if I'm planning something out like ahead of time, like which way am I supposed to go or how long is it going to take me to get there? You print, you print it out? No, no, no. <laughs> and then when I get in the car, I put the address in. Um, you know, I also use Google Maps, oddly enough, for somebody who works in the restaurant industry. Sometimes like I just don't know what I want and I'll just take a walk through my neighborhood on Google Maps to see what restaurants I'm not thinking of. Okay. Uh, but but ways in the car because it'll tell you if a cop is coming up because uh, the other ways users have reported it. And like, I don't know if I'm going 85, maybe I want to slow it down to 70. Uh, what is your favorite social app? Man, it was, it was LinkedIn for a solid couple months there when I was getting all the love that we were talking about before. Yeah. Um, but I think outside of that, it's, it's probably Instagram. That's where I spend, uh, the most time sending weird memes to all of my friends. Is there any weird app that you use a lot that, uh, you enjoy or that the audience should know about? Um, this is not going to be useful for your audience at all. But on on <laughs> you Saturday, know. We, have on an eclectic, Saturday, we have an eclectic audience. <laughs> on Saturdays, I tend uh, Saturdays and Sundays I tend to log into the uh, Twin Spires app and bet on some horses. Everybody's okay. on draft really? Kings, everybody's on DraftKings and everything. You're betting on horses? You bet on I, any I horses know, in Del Mar? I don't know much about sports, uh, so I'm not doing the parlays and the over unders and the money lines and everything like that. But I grew up, my, my dad's a big horse racing fan. We grew up going to the horse track. Wow. Uh, and uh, it's not a habit, but it's fun. <laughs> and it, it trickles into my weekend sometimes. So if, if uh, you know, you want to involve yourself in one of the most majestic and frustrating sports that you could possibly bet on, uh, maybe the Twin Spires app is for you. That is phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> best place for people to connect with the restaurants and connect with you? Uh, to connect with me, I am uh, MW Fishman on all of the socials and things like that. Uh, for the restaurants on Instagram, we are uh, Bar Kumiko. We are Jung Chicago, J E O N G Chicago uh, on Instagram, and then Oriole uh, Chicago as well uh, awesome. for for those guys. Happy to happy to connect and and would love to talk to some people about restaurants because. I- What's I can't that? wait to come out and visit. Uh, we go to Chicago every year for National Restaurant Association show. So, Michael, I I don't know how we're going to figure it out, but we'll figure it out. We're we will ahead. absolutely figure it out. And uh, the next time I'm in California, I'd love to come see you, too. Please do. Appreciate right. you. Uh, thank you guys for listening. If you want to connect with me at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. As always, stay curious, get involved, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Appreciate you guys.